Hello, everybody. Welcome. Uh, my name is Steve Harper, and I'm a professor of church history and doctorate at Brigham Young University. And I have the very good fortune today of being able to interview Professor James Faulkner. Jim, will you introduce yourself to us? Sure. Uh, I have been a professor of philosophy at BYU since 1975, and then the last several years have been a research fellow at Wheatley and now at the Maxwell Institute. Terrific. Thank you. And the reason we're here today is to talk about your new book, Thinking Otherwise, which I've had the good fortune to uh, read an advanced copy of. So thanks for writing it. Oh, thank you. And thanks for being here to talk to us about it. Is there anything you want to say right off the top about it? It's, it's difficult to know what to say off the top of my head. Um, the book was initially started years and years ago as an attempt to try to bring things together for people in the philosophy of psychology class to sort of give them a quick history of philosophy and why I think certain ideas are, have been influential, but sometimes kind of secretly influential, the things we don't think about or notice. And that's, that was the genesis, and I've thought about it in a variety of ways over the last couple of years and decided to write a book. Great. I'm glad you did. <laughs> it must be satisfying to see it in print. It is. Well, over the years, I've been delighted and challenged, I should say, by your insistence that we think about the scriptures, that we do hard intellectual work with the scriptures. And in the intro of this book, you say that this book is directed at Latter-day Saints who, for whatever reason, feel the need to do theology. Can you tell us what you mean by that? When I first joined the church uh, in 1962, my family moved almost immediately to Korea, where there were very few Korean saints and even fewer uh, Anglo saints. And uh, in fact, at the time, there was uh, only one other uh, LDS family in, in South Korea. And we were fortunate enough to be stationed in the same city where they were. So we had a small little branch of about 13 people or so with the two families and worshiped. The, the man that uh, was already there was a Latter-day Saint who had a huge collection of Latter-day Saint books. Uh, most of them were books of LDS history, or of uh, sort of classic works of Latter-day Saint theology from the 19th century, from the early 20th century. And he encouraged me to read those books. And I used to read, since I was just a new member of the church and I was excited, I would read them uh, pretty voraciously. And I discovered that there are lots of people in the church who have this, I might call it an itch, uh, a desire to think about these things in an intellectual way. And it took me many years to realize that uh, it, I was mistaken in my belief at the time that that was a superior way to be a member of the church. I thought somehow I was a better member if I was an intellectual member. And I think that's a mistake that lots of us make, especially those of us in college or those of us who are professors or whatever, we start thinking that being a professor is the height of all spirituality. It isn't? Yeah, well, uh, not as far as I can tell. <laughs> it's, uh, so, um, but, I, but I had that, and it took me many years to get over that and to come to another understanding. And yet, at the same time, I didn't lose this desire I had to think about things uh, in a reflective... Uh, I, I'm going to say intellectual, though I don't want to mean that by... I don't mean by that some superior way, just... That's a particular way of thinking about things, to think about things in this reflective way. And uh, I, I still had that desire and recognized there are lots of other Latter-day Saints who also have it. So I wrote this book for them, but also I wanted to persuade them of what I think I'd learned, and that is that there is a better way to do theology. And that was given to us by the prophets and given to us in the scriptures, and that it is... Scripture study is a better way to do theology than the way I'd been trained for, I don't know, 20 or 30 years or whatever to, to do it. Help us understand what you mean when you make that claim that scripture study is, is the best way to do theology. What do you mean by, by that? Well, 
um, it's a common place in a theology class or a philosophy class to say that the word theology means talk about God, but it's it's a made up word, right? And and so it can also mean God's talk. It's just two words stuck together. One of them is God, and one of them is language or talk or thinking. And somebody put them together and said, that's what we're going to call this discipline. And it remains a question in theology as to whether is this what we have to say about God? Or is this something where we're trying to say, what is it that God has to say about himself to us? And I think that if it's the latter, which is what it should be, then he has been saying that to us for thousands of years. And he's been saying it through the prophets and apostles and other people who have received his revelations and transmitted them to us in the collections that over time uh, people have recognized as valuable and as having his spirit. And so people have said, look, these are books that contain God's revelation of himself to us. So it's a little bit odd to then say, okay, I have that set of things given to me by God, but I'm going to do this other thing over here on the side, and that's what's really the way I, that's really the way I'm going to understand what it is that he has to say about himself. I think he's already said what he has to say about himself, and he did it in the Bible and the Book of Mormon and the Doctrine and Covenants and the Pearl of Great Price, and in con General Conference and all the other times that the prophets speak to us. Thank you. Thank you. You've You've talked a lot at the, at the beginning of the book, especially about the problem of the one and the many. Can you say something about that to us? Many of us have never heard of the Parmedian one. Why does it have such yeah. power over us? So in about the fifth century BC, there's this Greek thinker named, named Parmenides. He's trying to understand with a lot of other Greek thinkers at the time, what is it that makes the world what it is? And these are thinkers who are rejecting uh, Greek mythology. who are saying, these stories about the gods, this is just, maybe it's metaphorical, but if it's not metaphorical, it's crazy. Right. So they're trying to think, what, what is it that makes the, the world what it is? And they decide that they're going to do it by finding the one thing that's common to everything. And some say, oh, it's water. And somehow or other, this is hard water. This table is hard water. And my coat is softer water. And, you know, uh, they try water, they try air. And Parmenides, I think, makes a brilliant move. And he says, I don't know what to call it. Let's just call it the one. That's the one thing that's common to everything. And then he starts trying to think about that one. And he says, well, you know, if we try to do that, we're going to have to do it. We can only use logic and reason to think about it. And over, you know, time, he begins to define this one as uh, something that can't change and that doesn't really have any parts. And um, it's not in time or space. And that idea then becomes a part of the culture of uh, the Greeks for hundreds of years. And it's a, it's, a, it's a part of the culture of the Greeks in the same way that many of our own ideas, it just seems natural. Mm -hmm. It seems natural for us to think that there's this power or force called gravity. But prior to Newton and Descartes and people like that, very few people thought in those terms. They would not have thought, oh, there's gravity. And yet, we don't stop to think about it. It's just, it's, it's, in, it's in the air. Well, they, that, for them, that was the one. They just thought that's the way you have to think. And so when early Christians ran into Greek philosophers, which was almost right away, and the Greek philosophers and even Greek government official, uh, Roman government officials and other people began demanding explanations. How, how do you... How do you justify what you believe? What do you, you know, and so on. 
the only thing available to them in order to make sense was to try to talk to them in terms of this one. And that meant that eventually theology turned into, uh, among other things, I'm, I'm really ridiculously oversimplifying hundreds and, and then also thousands of years of, of thinking, but that became a thread in theology, a very prominent and important thread. It, and it's very often the way we think about God, and it, it, in the same way, it's also become quite natural to us. I'm, I was taken by that. It was a powerful <clears throat> idea in the book, and one that I've, ever since I read it a few months ago, I haven't been able to stop seeing implications for everywhere I look. So I appreciated that very much. Another uh, thing you say is that Joseph's teachings responded to Nietzsche's criticism even before he made it. Tell us what you mean by that. Yeah. So Nietzsche is um, Nietzsche's a very controversial thinker. He was a powerful critic of Christianity. He was not a believer by any stretch of the imagination, though his father was a Protestant minister. Um, and uh, as he looked around himself in Vienna and its environs and, you know, northern Italy and that part of Europe, at the time, what he saw of Christianity was a Christianity that had, uh, had started out by saying, these are ideas that can help us form relationships uh, to make a, a, a pleasurable, good life with each other and other people. And, uh, and yet, he says, those ideas had lost their power. But nobody noticed that they had. So he said, these are ideas that uh, formed Christianity, and he thinks that was, they were positive when they did, but now by the time we begin in 19, the end of the 19th century uh, and the beginning of the 20th, at that time, Nietzsche is saying, this no longer works. It's a, it's a form of culture that doesn't work, and yet we keep paying uh, homage to it. We keep pretending that it does. And so he tells this story, uh, a kind of parable, about uh, this, this madman who runs into the marketplace, the main part of town, and he's crying out, God is dead, God is dead. And people look at him, and some people say, yeah, we all knew that. Again, come on, you know, we're sophisticated people, we know all that. And other people say, no, no, this just isn't true. And, and the madman says, no, actually, God is dead, and we have killed him. But how is it that we could have drunk up the sea? How is that possible that, we, that this has happened? And the point of the story is, we need to recognize that this cultural way of seeing things doesn't work anymore, and we need to find a replacement. Mm -hmm. Now, I think that Joseph Smith's understanding, uh, a, a different understanding of who our Father in Heaven is, is, now it's not what Nietzsche was looking for, I'm not saying that, but I think it is an answer to that question, mm -hmm. is to say, you're right, our culture has, has been going down this road, it's adopted a notion of God that has turned out not to work, but I've got a, a, a revelation and my revelation is that there's another way of thinking about God. That is a captivating part of the book. I was, I was compelled by that. I appreciated it. I'm hoping I can get you to elaborate on what you mean uh, by scripture study. Scripture study. That means yeah. something different to you, I think, than it does. I might imagine. Well, um, the first thing I want to say is I don't think there are any... This may be too strong. I was going to say, I don't think there are any bad ways of studying scripture, but there might be. <laughs> you know, I, I'm not going to say in advance that there are no bad ways. But I think that, you know, if someone said, do you think that the, uh, the sort of standard 15 minutes a day, flip through your scriptures, you get to a point and then you quit and then you do it the next day, do you think that's bad? And I think the answer to that is no. I, don't, I think there's nothing wrong with that. I think there's a place for it. When I was a missionary, the only thing about that that I hated was I fairly regularly had companions who would stop, even if we were in the middle of the verse, right? We were told to read 10 pages. 
we got to page 10, it didn't matter, we stopped. I, that, I guess, would have been, a, that was a bad form of Teacher's Day. But uh, so I'm, I, I'm fine with that. In fact, I think that it's important for us to go through the standard works as a whole fairly regularly so that other kinds of scripture study get a context. However, that said, I think for me, a more important kind of scripture study is one where I focus on very small pieces. There's a, a word in, uh, uh, I don't know what to call it, scripture, scripture study called a, a pericope. A pericope just means a chunk, but it means a, mean, a story would be a pericope or one uh, 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 piece of the law. But something that makes sense in the Bible, for our version, for example, these are marked up by the paragraph. Markers. They're all, yeah, the, the paragraph markers to mark off of a pericope. So you just find a chunk that you think this, this piece is a piece that makes sense as a whole, as a unit, and I want to read that very closely. And so I want to look up all the words even sometimes, maybe especially words where I'm positive I know what it means. Right? Because sometimes that comes as a surprise. Um, if I'm doing Bible study, then I, I use various tools to find out the Greek and the Hebrew. And you don't have to be a Greek or Hebrew scholar to do that. There are online tools. Uh, the Blue Letter Bible will get you to those things. That's an excellent very easily resource. So... Um, I use those things to find out what do the Greek and Hebrew words mean here for the Old Testament and the New Testament. I also try to look at what kinds of things are put next to each other. Maybe even if I'm looking at this story in the New Testament, what story comes before it and what story comes after it. And I ask myself, whoever wrote this, whether I'm looking at Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Letters of Paul, whatever, whoever wrote this put these things together in a particular order for a reason. And I want to know why the, why these things are put together the way they are. Almost everything in Scripture could at least theoretically been written in a different order. So this order makes some has some meaning. I want to look at things uh, like uh, chiasmus, but also other, there are lots of other ways in which language uh, forms repetitions and relations among words. I want to look at how those things are related. I want to look at connectives like if and then. You know, how do these things, what are they joining? Um, one of the things that I think when I've talked with students, I think very frequently students don't pay attention to the question of where does this sentence begin and where does it end? And in scripture, sometimes in the Doctrine of Covenants, we have some really long sentences. <laughs> right? So the question is, you know, what's going on in this long sentence? Right? And what's the subject? And what's the what the, the main subject with the main verb? And those are important questions for understanding this. So for me, that is, uh, that's the kind of scripture study that for me, in the long run, is the most satisfying. Dr. Cummins, section 132, verse 7, might be the longest and most important sentence in the scriptures. <laughs> I'll, I'll take you, I'll have to go look it up. <laughs> <laughs> Jim, you talk about performative theology. Will you tell us what that is and how it relates to scripture study? Yeah. The idea is that scripture is trying to do something. We sometimes make the mistake of thinking that what scripture is, is a set of doctrines. And if I just learn the doctrines, then I've got it. But if... If that's what scripture is, then it's really badly written. I mean, we could have had a little slim volume, <laughs> right? 50 pages. These are the doctrines. Learn these. You're good. Um, and I think even a book like that can be really helpful to new converts. So I, again, I'm not, I'm not saying we should never have that kind of thing, but I think it's important to recognize scripture is not that kind of thing. So but that's because scripture is trying to do something, and I think in the words of the Book of Mormon, it's trying to make a to, to invite us to come to Christ. And so it seems to me that that's what it's trying to perform. It's trying to show us 
just doing this act, inviting us to come to Christ. If I'm doing theology, then what I should be doing is trying to show two things at the same time. One of them is I should be trying to show how Scripture makes that invitation, but the way that I do theology should be a part of making that invitation. So there's not just a kind of abstract, mm -hmm. uh, you know, here's what it did, and then it did this, and then that, but, but e even my very, the very act of thinking about how it performs should itself be a per performative invitation to come to Christ. So I may not, uh, in fact, in most cases, I probably don't overtly bear my testimony in what I write. But I hope that my testimony comes in the way that I do this so that it, it comes as an invitation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can see that. You perform yeah, the you, invitation. Yeah, you try to, yeah, you, and you show how scripture performs that invitation. In doing so, you invite others right. to come. Terrific. I was, uh, I was one of the best things I learned from thinking otherwise is to think of well, thank you. a scripture study in terms of performative theology. It, it's made me a better professor of the scriptures as well as a <laughs> disciple, I hope. Well, thank you. I hope. Well, what bad habits do we have that make it difficult for us to hear what the scriptures have to say? I think the worst bad habit is that we think we already know what they say. So, even in scriptures like Isaiah, where we think this is really hard, we think this is really hard, but I already know what it has to say. And so I can go get a book by a BYU professor, you know, maybe in religious ed, maybe in philosophy, but there's some BYU professor who's going to help me figure it out. And then that'll be, and then, I, then I'll know. And so when I read um, First Nephi, that's the scripture probably the Latter-day Saints have read more than any other scripture. Just because the fact that we sometimes get bogged down, stop, and then we start over again. So all of us have read First Nephi 1, I don't know how many. And the problem with reading any book over and over again is, is really soon you begin to think, since I know what this means, you sort of say in your head as you go along, it's like reading, like I don't know, recitation. But sometimes what you're saying in your head is not what's on the page. Not just that the words are, are, are different. Though even then, sometimes if you start looking, you think, wait a minute. That doesn't say that the way that I thought it did. Right? It's different than I thought. But sometimes even if you say, yeah, I know those words. I, Nephi, haven't been born of goodly parents, and so on. I can recite those words. If I, if I think I already know what they mean, then I'm not asking myself, what do they mean? And, I, so I think, and that's the bad habit. The bad habit is to, to say, what is it that this scripture is saying to me that perhaps I hadn't expected. And, uh, and that's why I think, from, I, you know, I can't tell you how many times someone has said to me, don't tell me to read the scriptures again. They just, are, they just get boring. I've read them so many times, over and over again, they're boring. And I think the answer to that is, well, then that means you're not actually reading them. You're just seeing what's on the page in a kind of cursory way, and repeating in your head what you already know. Yes, that's a habit I could I could uh, break. Well, we all need, work on. We all need to work on that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, one of the best things too about thinking otherwise is the learned but gentle way that it explains these principles and practices of scripture study, and then enacts them in a close reading, close readings of Doctrine and Covenants section one hundred twenty one and Moses 5. So I'd like to hear what you have to say about that. About those two pieces of scripture? or Yeah, about... you, can, you can take that in as many parts as you want. Don't hurry this. Don't hurry this answer. <laughs> um, both of those 
pieces were written in response to uh, a demand. Right? Someone said, uh, I was in a, in a context where someone said, you need to write about Moses 5. And I read Moses 5 and I thought, I have nothing to say. I just couldn't think of anything. And, you know, I did what we do. I, I prayed about it. I reread it. I, I took notes. And I just genuinely thought, I don't have anything to say about this. And uh, there's a similar thing that, that happened with Section 121. The uh, editors, as they were looking at this book, said, you need one more chapter. And it needs to be a reflection on scripture study and preferably, you know, something from the Doctrine of Covenants. And I, I have to confess, it, the Doctrine of Covenants is my least favorite scripture. Now, that doesn't mean it, I don't like it. It just means if I could always choose, I'd always choose something else. <laughs> I don't think you're alone. <laughs> I probably am not. And um, so... I began to think, well, okay, I could just do that last part of section 121 because it's one that I, I think is important to us, our understanding who we are in terms of the restoration. But then I looked at it and I thought, why is it that I don't want to do the whole section? And I reread it and I thought, because I don't have any idea how the first part fits with the second part. And again, I, I just, nothing seemed to be mm -hmm. giving me any ideas in both cases though what I tried to do was I thought suppose that I just try to just start using my imagination I'm going to start writing down the most random ideas that I can about what I'm reading here and see what comes of that imagination trying to imagine. Imagine what's going on in Moses 5. Is it, can I, if I were, you know, trying to create another version, what would I say, or, you know, anything like that. The same thing with DNC uh, 121. Why does it begin the way that it does? And, and, and then switch to this other discussion of, of priesthood power. And I mean, what's going on here? Mm -hmm. And in both cases, by beginning to imagine that, I, I came up with some ideas. And I think the ideas allowed me to see those pieces in a new way and as a whole, each one as a whole, uh, but without feeling that somehow I had now solved what Moses 5 means or what DNC 121 means. I just, I guess for me, the, the nice thing about the, using the imaginative approach was to say, I think now I have a better understanding of both of those things, and I have learned things that were important to my own spiritual uh, existence, but I think it leaves them there to be imagined again. Mm -hmm. to be re I can go back and read them, and somebody can write to me and say, you know, you said this about Verse such and such, you're just wrong, and I can say, that's actually a really good point. I am just wrong. <laughs> that part of my imagination didn't work very well. Or to say, well, I just I can't see it the way you imagine it. I imagine it this way. And I can say, well, I that's okay. There's more than one possible way of thinking about these things. So it freed me up in a way, thinking in those terms freed me up in a way that I didn't feel like I had to be dogmatic on the one hand, and on the other hand, I could recognize them as genuine revelations and revelations that were not only for me personally, but I think had something to say to other people. Thank you. I found your, your faith in the scriptures very refreshing. Uh, we both study the scriptures and scripture scholars who are critical in, in every sense of the word, in the positive sense and in the negative sense. And I was refreshed by how... Um, faithfully you read the scriptures you take them uh, at face value without being naive you're not naive about how they were composed uh, what they what they are and uh, yet there's this wonderful faith can't think of a better word that 
exudes from your way of approaching the scriptures. I appreciate that very much. Um, one of the takeaways for me from thinking otherwise is that it's possible to love God with my mind, to be faithful and devoted to the restored gospel of Jesus, uh, uh, restored gospel of Jesus Christ, to follow prophets, to believe in Scripture, all without being dogmatic. And I really appreciate that. What, what was that your intention to convey that? Yeah, I hoped to. Um, uh, I do think that one of the problems we sometimes have is that if we feel like if we're going to do theology, we can't avoid dogmatism. And that sometimes we feel that way in a sort of positive way. Well, okay, I'm going to just tell you what these things mean, and there we are. And sometimes we feel that in a negative way. No, don't do it, because then you'll have to be dogmatic. Um, and I, th I think my, so my experience has been that... Um, Studying scripture opens me up to receiving revelation, but not to, it doesn't open me up to telling everybody else what they have to think, right? And so, but even revelation that I can share, and, and it may be useful, but in a way, it, it does help me to, to, to say the scriptures are there as a body of uh, writing that we can continue to go to and continue to learn from. And if that's true, then nothing that I say should be dogmatic. Because if, if I were dogmatic in, in, the, in this negative sense, right? If I said, that's what they mean, then that would mean no one had to read them again. Mm -hmm. We could have that little pamphlet. <laughs> no, you would save us some trouble. Yeah, <laughs> but it wouldn't, wouldn't be nearly as, uh, as fun. No, sir. Well, you have, um, you have done a, a lot of important work to convince me and others that we need to work hard with our minds. We're going to love God with all our minds. We need to engage His Word, think seriously about it, internalize it, go back to it over and over again. You started off by saying you're not you're not trying to um, impeach or discredit other approaches to Scripture, but you've carved out a um, a niche of making the scriptures more difficult, harder. Um, help, help us understand what you mean by that and why it's a valuable yeah. approach, why it's not off-putting or shouldn't be off-putting to us. Uh, yeah, I hope it's not off-putting. <laughs> um, in the preface to each of the uh, Scriptures Made Harder series that I've done, I have a piece from uh, the early 19th century Danish thinker uh, Søren Kierkegaard and uh, paraphrased, he said something that's, it's actually quite funny in, in context, but I think also really, uh, it persuaded me a, a lot. He says, I was, I was really trying to figure out what I could do to make humanity better. And he's living at a time when there's a great technological change, probably as, for, for, for that time, the te change technologically was as rapid as it, as it is for us with the steam engine and all of these things that are coming along. And he said, well, somebody's already made the locomotive. and you know, This is a whole bunch of new developments. He said, so there's nothing like that that I can do. But I could do this. Everybody has made life easier. I could make it harder. <laughs> And I, I thought about that, and I thought, you know, when I was in graduate school, I had the privilege of studying for a semester with uh, Jewish rabbis, do, and that's where much of what I learned about scripture study came from. And my studies with Rabbi Goldman convinced me that slowing down and reading carefully uh, is, in, is incredibly profitable. And so I want to help other Latter-day Saints learn to have that same opportunity. And that is, I want to make them harder in that sense, right? Mm -hmm. To not, not to make them, they don't, I don't think that I'm saying, no, they're more profound, profound than you thought they were. I would say they are profound, 
And the way to that profundity is to slow down and let them speak rather than to skim through them or to find a handbook to tell you what they say. Fantastic. That is a great contribution well, thank you. that you have made. Jim, this has been a great visit. I really appreciate it. Tell us what you want us to take away from thinking otherwise. First of all, I want to thank you. You know, this is very kind of you to do this. I suppose there are two takeaways that I would like a person to get from this book. And one of them is uh, from the first part of the book, and that is that the revelations that Joseph Smith has given us are really of a different way of thinking about our Father in Heaven than we than we understand. And that difference is, is more important than sometimes we understand. Deeper and more profound, uh, yeah. I would say, after reading the book. Yeah, I, I think I knew the premise you just said, but I came away with a much deeper sense of what you mean by it after reading the book. Thank you. Because yeah, I I just think Joseph Smith has very insightful, different things to say about the world than we understand him to, to have done. And sometimes we will even say that without recognizing how different it really is. And I wanted, that's the first takeaway. I want to see how Joseph Smith contrasts with the tradition in a very quick way that's unfair to the tradition. I, I mean, I should be honest about that. But accessible to someone like me. You know, I, I don't yeah. read the Greek philosophers in depth. I, well, yeah, the, and I, I don't know it well enough to have written the thousand page book that would do it justice perhaps. We're all thankful that you didn't. <laughs> but the second takeaway was that um, as true as the first takeaway is, more important than, than knowing a list of the things that Joseph Smith teaches that are different than the tradition is knowing that our Father in Heaven has spoken and continues to speak to us and that in doing so he has said things that can really nourish our souls and bring us to his son and they really can change our lives for the better and that we you know i carry those around in my pocket all the time and they're there they're available there's this the the word of god literally the words that god has to say to me are right there available and they can invite me to come to his son, Jesus Christ, and they do so if I pay attention to them. Thank you very much. Again, thank you.